Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our monthly hazardous webinar series. This is where we take a closer look at one of Natural Hazard Research Australia's research projects, its findings, and how it will be translated into practice with members of the project team and the people who will use the research. I'm Nicola Moore, I'm the Queensland and Northern Territory Node Research Manager with NHRA. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting across a range of different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands. Here in beautiful and humid, humid Mianjin, Brisbane, I'm on the lands of the Yugger and Turrbal peoples, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present and acknowledge that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. First Nations people have long looked after and cared for country as kin and continue to do so today. And I'm a guest here on Yuggera Turrbal country, as I am wherever I walk in Australia, as sovereignty has never been ceded. And all of us can play a fundamental role in dismantling the ongoing processes of colonisation and supporting Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people on this journey. After all, we all share the same fundamental goal, that of resilient and sustainable landscapes and communities and everything in between. So I'm going to go through some housekeeping before we start. Uh, today's panel will be recorded and a link to it and any presentation materials will be made available to you in the coming week or so. Please let us know if you're having any technical problems today. Just add the details into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and our team will help troubleshoot any issues with you. We're going to commence the presentation shortly and we invite you to add any questions um, you have into the Q&A section using the tab at the bottom of your screen. And questions will be answered at the end of the formal panel presentation. So please make sure you specify who your question is for and we'll get to them in the last 15 minutes of the webinar today. NHRA is very pleased to have supported this project, Awareness, Education and Communication for Compound Natural Hazards. The need for this research and its scope was identified via a stakeholder Shop we hosted in early 2022, where the issues around compound natural hazard events were raised and specific issues around public information and communication were deemed a priority for this work. Because we know when facing threats from similar or different compound hazards, individuals, communities and businesses need to be prepared and to be able to respond effectively. And stakeholders need to know, what does the research say? on how emergency management organisations can effectively engage with communities to ensure coordinated and consistent public information. This project aimed to define and identify the nature of compound disasters, their characteristics and how at greater frequency potential Sorry. <laughs> Please excuse, excuse me for a minute. <laughs> Um, we co-located with somebody with another office at the moment and um, neglected to um, advise them that we were running a webinar from this um, office this morning. So we've got a fire alarm test happening. So you can see this is exercising and preparedness in action. <laughs> and it takes the priority. we might be safe to proceed. Um, where was I up to? Yes. This project aimed to define and identify the nature of compound disasters, their characteristics, and how a greater frequency of natural hazards may alter people's vulnerability and exposure, delivering an advanced understanding of current research and global best practice approaches to community engagement around compound disasters. The research team, Herald from two universities that are working in collaboration on the project. The University of Tasmania and Deakin University in Victoria. And the teams conducted desktop and on the ground social research with compound hazard affected communities in the Dandelong Ranges in Victoria 
in Eyre, that's located in the Burdekin region in North Queensland, and in Tenterfield in New South Wales, to develop a framework that's been co-created with communities and potential stakeholders to guide better communication and engagement on compound natural hazards. The framework is intended to be a fit for purpose to be fit for purpose and useful to emergency preparedness, management recovery agencies and the communities they serve. Throughout the project so far, we've been really fortunate to have key representatives from New South Wales Rural Fire Services, key end users engaged in the project's um, management committee. And today we have Shelley Smart from New South Wales Rural Fire Service with us. And Shelley will be providing an end user perspective on how these research findings and the resulting framework will help inform community engagement policy. So it's my pleasure today to introduce the four panellists. Dr. Gabby McCarter is an interdisciplinary researcher who investigates environmental climate change and natural hazard communication. And Gabby is a senior research fellow in climate science communication with the Climate Futures Program at the University of Tasmania. And Gabby is also a 2024-25 Fulbright Fellow. I'd like to introduce Dr. Erin Hawley. Erin's a senior lecturer in communication at Deakin University and Erin researches environmental communication in relation to diverse audiences, including children and youth. She has an in-depth knowledge of varied approaches to communication for environmental literacy and expertise in social research methods. Professor Josh Newton. Josh is a social marketer with extensive experience conducting community engaged research into motivating the adoption of behaviours that benefit individuals and communities. And of course, Shelley Smythe. Shelley's the manager of community risk at New South Wales Rural Fire Service and is passionate about leading her teams to be their best and developing better ways to protect communities. So a big welcome to all four panelists. And now I'll hand over to Gabby to start the presentation. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you so much, Nicola, for that great introduction. And um, I'll just share my screen and, and start our presentation today. Um, and thanks to NHRA for supporting this work and also to the other members of our research team who aren't here today, Professor Christy Hess and Assistant Professor Tim Neal and our wonderful research assistants who have enabled this work and, and assisted along the way. So I hardly need to uh, reiterate to the audience here today that hazard events are increasing at the moment in frequency and or intensity uh, due to, to the climate change that we're experiencing. And we know that awareness, education and communication are really crucial for underpinning the preparedness, response and recovery and resilience building that we need to see in the face of those hazards. However, we also know, as Nicola said, that there's no established best practice framework for how this might be done in relation to compound hazards in particular, how emergency managers and other hazard communicators might engage, best engage communities on compound natural hazards in particular. So this project has aimed to fill that gap by working with communities to co-create a tailored framework, which does exactly that, um, which uh, lays out a process for compound hazard engagement um, uh, to better prepare people for the increasing hazards that we're seeing and increase, that are increasingly compound in nature. So we very quickly established uh, in the course of this research that there's there's no consensus on what constitutes a compound hazard and no one definition for what compound hazards actually are. So we use this one from the IPCC as a working definition and it underpins our understanding of compound hazards in this work. Um, but we did discover that in our research on the ground that most emergency managers and many and most community members don't understand the term compound hazards and aren't using it. So here's our, our, uh, the definition we used um, in this research, that compound natural hazards are two or more extreme disaster events occurring simultaneously or successively. They can also be combinations of extreme events with underlying conditions that amplify their impact or combinations of events that are not themselves extreme, but which collectively lead to extreme impacts. So uh, this study asked four key questions. We wanted to know what compound hazards look like in an Australian context. Uh, 
what international best practice for awareness raising and education and communication around compound hazards might be? Um, how can emergency management organisations here in Australia best engage with communities around compound hazards specifically? And, and also the who in all of this. So what stakeholders and collaborations are required to effectively engage with communities on compound hazards? So those are the, the, the four key questions that we sought to answer in this research. So just a very brief summary of what we did. Uh, we undertook a literature review of global peer-reviewed articles on education awareness and communication for compound hazards. I'll explain more about that in a moment and show a few results. We then, as Nicola said, did case study research on the ground with three compound hazard affected communities in Australia. We held three town hall events in those locations. We undertook 38 interviews, mostly with emergency managers, but also with um, community leaders in those areas. Uh, we uh, disseminated a survey, which Josh is going to talk about in detail. And we also engaged with local media. I'll explain more about that in a moment. We also then held subsequently two uh, research participant feedback events uh, when we were in the first stage of framework development to get people's feedback on what we produced. And then incorporating that free feedback, we've produced a compound hazard engagement framework to guide best practice. And that's what I'll present at the end of, of today's um, slides and presentation. So just a few highlights first from the lit review. We undertook this desktop systematic quantitative literature review um, of a selection of many thousands of papers. We narrowed it down to 45 peer reviewed papers. And we established that what constitutes compound hazards is not clearly defined or agreed on in the literature. Um, but there is an agreement that with increasing risk for, of, of hazards co-occurring that awareness is needed and it's really important and foundational for improving communities resilience. And finally, we established that there's no you know, guiding key framework on a global basis uh, for compound hazard communication. So there is indeed this gap um, that has been perceived here in Australia, and that is a, a global gap as well. So just a few figures from that literature review work. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the global literature review reveals that research is increasing over time. So there's more interest as probably as more compound hazards are, incur are occurring. And the use of this idea of compound hazards or the actual word compound hazards uh, does appear to be increasing overall as well within um, other study studies that you know, look at multiple hazards. And on that uh, subject, here are some of the many terms, we counted 22 overall that are used to describe what we understand as compound hazards. So the most widely used terms currently are multi-hazard, cascading hazard, and multiple hazard. As I said, 22 different terms used synonymously with compound hazards, which shows that you know, even the term itself is not widely used or well-established, well but the use of the term compound hazard is increasing. And uh, the research is not, in, not all that global, actually. Um, there are many research gaps, including, as you can see from this map, uh, particularly Africa and Latin America, where we know that compound hazards are frequently occurring. But Australia, along with the US, is at the forefront of compound hazard research we established from this lit review. So our project case study locations, as Nicola mentioned, the Dandenong Ranges, Air and the Bird Can Try in Queensland and Tenterfield. So in the Dandenong Ranges, we were working with a community that had experienced um, severe storms twice in 2021 during the COVID, during COVID lockdowns. Um, 25,000 large mountain ash trees had fallen, many of them on people's houses, over 200 houses were destroyed and infrastructure locations within communities destroyed and some still not rebuilt. Uh, in air in the Birkin Shire, that's an area subject to repeat cyclones and flooding year after year. And Tenterfield, we were working with a community that ex had experienced um, the Black, sorry, the um, Black Summer bushfires, some, one of the first communities to be impacted in, in September of that year, uh, followed by, for them, a flood event which caused water contamination for almost three months. Their water was an un undrinkable. And then, in fact, they've been impacted by fire again subsequently. So several times in 2023. 
So definitely compound hazard affected community, uh, communities. So in selecting these case study locations, we wanted to have a diversity of um, community types, hazard types, geographical spread, and it was also important that local media were present there, and also that we avoided over-researched locations, which is a factor in, in consideration now. Um, I'll come to media in a moment, but I just wanted to talk about what we ask community, uh, communities when we were working with them. So I wanted to know how they understand and experience compound hazards. Um, how do how does it when a hazard is compound how does that increase vulnerability and what information engagement did they receive if any who communicates with them on natural hazards what works in their communities for natural for hazard communication because it's different everywhere and what media channel channels do they use and what sources do they trust these kinds of questions and many more um we wanted to work with local media in order to to um you know, uh, use those channels that people locally use themselves. So we know that local media can be important advocates for the needs of communities, and this project worked with them both to convey the research project to, co to communities in an informational way and to invite participation, but also uh, we published articles um, in local media and undertook interviews on um, community radio to help communities better understand the, the kind of risks that they face and what compound hazards actually are. So I'll just end with a few examples of the, the media coverage and articles that we placed. This was the Dandenong Rangers, uh, Rangers Star Mail. And um, so they published several articles. As you can see, that was a fantastic um, place for us to interact with. And here are just some examples of um, the Tenterfield Star's coverage of compound hazards and the research itself. And finally, as I said, we worked with community radio. Um, we undertook uh, several interviews with community radio in, in uh, the locations, uh, discussed compound hazards with, the, with community radio presenters and uh, also local media's important role in emergency broadcasting and preparedness as well. So uh, that's a quick summary of what we did. And I'll now hand over to my colleague, Erin, who is going to discuss some of the results from, first of all, the qualitative work. Thanks, Gabby, and hi, everyone. So one of our primary goals in this project was to identify whether communication and community engagement should be different in a compound hazard context, and we found that, yes, it does, and it does for a, a number of reasons. So firstly, the communication landscape can become very crowded and cluttered and confusing when more than one disaster impacts a community. The volume of messaging increases, messages are likely to be coming from multiple sources. Due to this confusion, misinformation is more likely to circulate and audiences are dealing with information overload as well. Compounding factors like power outages and communication blackouts are also more likely to occur during a compound hazard uh, situation and themselves make the experience of a hazard worse. In fact, some of our participants told us that the experience of a power outage or a communication blackout was a disaster in itself from their perspective. These things can also interfere with the sharing and the accessing of information. And this means that usually reliable channels of communication, especially websites and online digital media, become less reliable and sometimes even inaccessible altogether. Another factor impacting communication for compound hazards is displacement. So individuals have moved into a new area, they might be cut off from support networks and sources of information. When an additional hazard emerges, displaced individuals might not have the existing knowledge or the understanding or the support to act in response. They might lack the capacity to interpret official messaging or they might have, might have failed to receive such messages in the first place. Compound hazards also tend to lead to more attention on communities in national news media coverage. A compound hazard is often more newsworthy than a single hazard, and a string of bad things happening to a community often leads to that community being represented negatively to the rest of the country and sometimes even to the rest of the world. And this is significant, we feel, because it can weaken community morale. There are also some positives here when we look at communication in a compound hazard situation. Communities who have lived through a compound natural hazard are potentially more experienced, more mobilized, more resourceful. 
And this makes them more receptive to communication, but also better communicators themselves. So experiences of a compound natural disaster can build social capital, leaving communities better equipped to deal with subsequent hazards. And all of this suggests that there are barriers to communication in a compound situ hazard situation, but also enablers of that communication as well. So I'm now going to address the findings from our interviews and our community forums, which informed the development of our framework. We conducted a thematic analysis on the qualitative data that we collected, and we identified five key themes, which I'm going to quickly go through. These themes were recurring ideas. So they were ideas that were frequently expressed, things that our participants frequently told us. But we were also closely guided by our research questions and our research objectives. So frequency alone wasn't enough for an idea to be identified as a theme. And this is following a model for thematic analysis outlined by the scholars Braun and Clark. And I'll point out too that these, these themes that I'm about to talk you through are not our framework, which Gabby is going to unveil a little bit later. They are the ideas that informed the development of our framework along with the survey findings, which Josh is going to tell you about in a moment. So our first theme is local knowledge and localised communication. And the idea that, if we could go to the next slide, please, Gabby. The idea that communication for compound hazards should be attuned to the needs and experiences of local communities rather than detached from it. So when it comes to compound hazards, local knowledge tends to accumulate, it tends to build up. This can be a resource. It can also be a complicating factor. In particular, it can be a problem when official messages are interpreted through the lens of local knowledge. So as one of our participants pointed out, locals might ask themselves, what happened last time the river was this high? Or what happened last time a cyclone hit? Rather than following the directions of emergency management and responding to the situation as it unfolds. At the same time, though, we found that local community groups and community champions are key communicators and intermediaries in a compound hazard situation. And we detected the presence of emergent groups and spontaneous volunteers, so people who stepped into leadership roles and or came together with others to help. Our next theme is vulnerability, diversity and inclusion. So we know from existing research that vulnerable groups are disproportionately affected by disasters. What our research found were some important connections between vulnerability and compound hazards, leading us to propose that just as there are compound hazards, so too are there compound vulnerabilities. And we use the word compound, compound vulnerabilities with two things in mind. So firstly, the vulnerability of a community increases when more than one disaster occurs. There are overlapping periods of vulnerability, so a community might be in recovery while grappling with a new disaster. At the same time, a disaster might be different or might be experienced differently for community members with existing vulnerabilities, such as those living with disability, family violence, chronic illness, or mental health conditions. And some of our participants asked us, is it a compound natural hazard if a disaster strikes and I'm already struggling because I live with a disability or I'm homeless or I'm ill? And this really challenged our definition of compound natural hazards because, yes, of course, these existing vulnerabilities are compounding factors which make a disaster seem like a compound hazard for some people, even if it doesn't technically fit that definition. With all of this in mind, communicators need to employ empathy. They need to take an inclusive approach that reaches and engages diverse audiences. So we agree with the work of other researchers who argue that disaster communication must attend to the needs of diverse groups, including migrant communities and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. However, we also identified other groups that might be marginalised or us isolated or especially vulnerable, particularly when compound hazards occur. So these include newcomers to local areas. They include those living remotely or off grid, those displaced by the first in a series of disasters, and also pockets or micro communities who are impacted by a disaster that those um, surrounding them aren't experiencing. So inclusive communication is a priority. And social media was identified by our participants as a particularly inclusive mode of communication. This was by communicators and audiences alike. 
But we also want to acknowledge here the inequalities and problems that surround social media use. So in this sense, we identify those who choose not to use social media and or those who are digitally excluded due to problems such as a lack of digital literacy or poor internet connectivity or those living in a communication blackout or black spot, sorry. We identify these as a marginalised and potentially vulnerable group as well. As I mentioned, the communication landscape can become crowded and cluttered and confusing when more than one disaster happens. And in the face of these problems, our participants told us that reliability of information and infrastructure becomes more important. Many of our participants spoke about the importance of single sources of information and clear central points of communication. We also found that any form of communication that provides visual or auditory proof of a disaster was seen as reliable. So people were telling us that the type of communication they trusted most was their own ears and eyes. And this means that any form of media that can simulate this act of seeing or hearing something with your own eyes and ears can be very effective. This includes, for example, webcam footage of a flooded road or an approaching bushfire. Print media and local radio were also identified as reliable sources. Print media because it can have survived power outages and communication blackouts and often takes the form of an object that sits in the household. And this might be a disaster information pack or even something like a fridge, a fridge magnet or a bookmark. Local radio similarly because it can be accessed through battery powered devices or even in cars and also because it plays an important role in holding a community together and becomes a source of information around which the community can gather during times of disaster. Interestingly, many of our participants spoke about language and communication itself. So the way we talk about disasters, the names that we give them. As Gabby has mentioned, we, fa we found that the term compound natural hazards is not widely used or understood, including by communities and the people that we were speaking with. So we propose that efforts to build community responsiveness and resilience in the face of compound natural disasters must begin by establishing this term as part of disaster discourse. If compound hazards are increasingly part of our future, we need to talk about them, we need to name them. And this will help us deal with another problem, which is that people tend to have a here and now mindset. So they don't want to deal with multiple things at once, even when sometimes this is exactly what has to happen. We also found a need for clearer and more consistent labelling of some disasters, especially storms, to better communicate their severity. And overall, a need for improved disaster communication literacies, where communities better understand and are better equipped to participate in the communication practices that enable preparedness, safety, recovery and resilience. For example, one of our forum participants in the Dandenong Ranges suggested that community members need to develop three strategies for staying connected and informed in times of disaster. And these can be strategies of their own choosing. For example, a preferred social media channel, a neighbor's phone number and local radio. Another interview participant stated that households should not expect a door knock every time disaster strikes. In other words, they should not passively wait for communication to happen to them. They should know how to seek out and share information. So this is all part of disaster communication literacy, as is the ability to identify disaster related misinformation. And based on our field work, we argue that there is a need to raise awareness of these communication related aspects of disaster preparedness. In other words, preparing for a disaster doesn't just mean securing your property or developing your evacuation plan. It also means making sure you can receive and provide reliable information. Our final theme relates to fatigue. So we know that compound hazards can leave communities feeling fatigued. But importantly, compound hazards also lead to warning fatigue and communication fatigue and an inability or an unwillingness to, to engage with new information. Communities impacted by more than one disaster may also develop a sense of what Martin Seligman calls learned helplessness, um, which is a psychological state that can occur when people experience multiple stressful events, leaving them feel, feeling unmotivated or powerless to act. And it was actually one of our participants who used this term. <laughs>
We found it very interesting that some of the problems expressed by our participants relate to the phenomenon known as news avoidance. So just as citizens today sometimes avoid the news, people in our case study communities were avoiding disaster messaging because they were time poor, they were weary, they were stressed, they were overwhelmed, or because the messaging had a negative effect on their mood. And again, this is tricky for communicators. How do you communicate with people when they don't want to listen anymore? So we propose, we took this into consideration when developing our framework. And one of the things that we propose is that creative hazard communication could be a solution here. So unexpected, innovative and novel ways to engage people, creative spins on traditional messages, including creative public information campaigns. So while there is a need for clarity and central points of communication, there can be creative ways to point people towards that central source. And this could extend to creative partnerships with other communicators and other stakeholders. For example, one of our participants in one of our community forums said that children were making pictures at school about disaster preparation that were being taken home to adults and families and, and stuck on the fridge or kept in the house. And this is a, we feel this is an effective form of communication that requires a bit of creative thinking and some partnership with local schools. Interestingly too, and still on the topic of children, another participant told us that creative communication was essential for engaging young people. So communicators need to think about color and visual elements, but also about storytelling, about putting a human face on the message. And relatedly, we found that young people themselves are effective communicators who are very responsive, especially in a compound hazard situation. So building capability for intergenerational communication is another very important strategy here. So those in a nutshell were some of our key findings from our interviews and our community forums. And I will now pass to Josh to tell you about the findings from our survey data. Lovely, thank you, Erin. So we conducted a series of surveys with residents of the Air Tenterfield and Dandenong Rangers communities. We had 182 residents complete these surveys collectively. And for each of those surveys, we're focusing particularly upon the focal um, compound hazard events that were described earlier. So for air, it was the 2017 and the 2019 floods. For Tenterfield, it was the 2019 fires followed by the water contamination event that also occurred in 2019. And for the Dandenong Rangers, it was the 2021 storms which were occurring against the backdrop of COVID. Next slide, please, Gabby. What we found is that the overwhelming majority of our residents were at least slightly somewhat very or extremely impacted by these particular events. We made sure that when we were doing our analysis, they were only focusing upon people who were residing in these communities at the time that these events were taking place. And it really does speak to the fact that when we're looking at these residents, the overwhelming majority had experienced at least some impact as a result of those activities. Next slide, please, Gabby. This is a zoom in on one of our communities and we'll paint a broader picture on the next slide, but it just helps I think to orientate to the broader trend that we identified. So the typical trend, and this is for the Tenterfield community with respect to the 2019 fires, is that there was a relatively high level of sense of perceived preparedness for the event before it took place. We can see here, for example, that we had only 15% of our residents who were describing themselves is only not at all or slightly prepared. The overwhelming majority felt that they had at least somewhat very or extreme levels of preparedness. That shifted, however, in the mid-course of the event. You can see that in terms of the middle column, where we have a far greater proportion of our residents starting to identify that, hang on a second, perhaps their levels of preparedness were not where they thought that they would be. And then at the end, in that after, um, after the 2019 fires took place, those sense of preparedness was much higher, potentially because participants had found ways to further disaster proof <clears throat> or has it um, improved their, their homes and the ways in which they'd be prepared to deal with those particular events moving forward. The one caveat to this, obviously, is that those post compound disaster events, the sense of preparedness hasn't necessarily always been tested. And so it's one thing to believe that you may have had an increased level of preparedness, whether that has been, uh, whether that would eventuate in the face of another separate event remains to be seen. Next slide, please, Gabby. <clears throat> 
So this paints the picture for what it looks like across all of, that, all of the communities that we were examining. And certainly that trend that I spoke to before with variations before, during and after the event, it certainly was observable for the two Tenterfield events that we're looking at, the 2019 um, fire events in Tenterfield, as well as the water contamination event in 2019 for Tenterfield, as well as also for the Dandenong Ranges. It was a little bit different, however, in the air community and perhaps because of the broader backdrop of regular flooding that has taken place within that particular community, that there was less of that variation in terms of the before, during and after sense of preparedness. So it really does speak to the fact that the broader context in which these events are occurring is important for looking at those perceptions of preparedness. Next slide, please, Gabby. On this particular slide, we're now looking at the channels that residents record encountering, as well as also the recalled perceived usefulness of the information that they received through those channels. So at the very bottom of the graph, we can see what the reach is for each of these channels. And so what we asked participants to do is to recall which particular channels they record. And so there's obviously always going to be issues of potential recall bias and issues where people may have encountered it, but not necessarily remember that they'd done so. But it really does speak to the fact that across the communities that we're looking at, social media was the was the channel that was recalled with the greatest um, the greatest proportion of participants, varying from 53% at the lowest to 75% at the highest. It was followed by other local radio and ABC radio, as well as being probably the second and third most commonly record channels that participants record encountering. It's important to note, however, that there are obviously some distinct variations across communities. And so while these are, there are some broad general trends that we can infer from this, it's always important to be reflexive of and understanding that there are going to be variations within communities as to the relative importance or the relative reach of particular channels. What we then also looked at, oh sorry Gabby, if you go back to the, the previous slide as well, is that amongst those people who had recorded encountering information through any of those channels, the perceived usefulness of the information, and that's the information that you can see, or, or the, the graph at the very top of the screen. What we found here is that social media was also seen as being particularly useful, although there was a little bit greater variation here, ranging from 33% to 88% of participants who record information through social media perceiving it to be useful with other local radio and ABC radio also being perceived as having high levels of useful information amongst those who had record encountering information through those channels. Next slide, please, Gabby. We then also had a look at the information sources that participants record across each of those communities. And there were some variations across the particular communities and the disaster events, sometimes because of the specific nuances of the event that we we're looking at. So emergency authorities and local government were seen as the two with the greatest level of record reach, as well as also the two information sources that were delivering perhaps the most useful levels of information. There are obviously a couple of caveats to that. We can see, for example, that in Tenterfield for that 2019 water contamination event, emergency authorities were seen as having low rates of reach, but that is, I think, reflexive of the nature of that particular event where emergency authorities are perhaps not going to be the lead agency for dealing with water contamination events in the same way that they would be for dealing with fires where we saw a far greater reach within that same community. The other informational source that's important to call out are the role of the more sort of informal connections that people have, whether through friends or family, as well as also with other community members. They had very high rates of record reach, and they were also seen as delivering relatively useful information as well, although friends and family were seen typically on average to be delivering slightly more useful information than other community members. With respect to the other sources of information that we're looking at, with recovery agencies, employees, schools, community groups, and religious groups, there was far greater variation across the particular communities as well as by the types of events. Broadly speaking, we can't ignore them, but it's just important to be attuned to what's going to really have that cut through from a local community uh, local community perspective to really ensure that you can tailor the way in which you communicate to those particular communities.
There was lots of other additional information we had from the survey findings, but given the, the relatively short duration of the webinar, really do encourage if you are interested, please have a look at the, the final report where there's lots of further survey findings and we go into it in a little bit more detail as well. But I'll hand across to, to Gabby for the next slide. Thanks for that, Josh. Right, now is the time to speak about the framework. So we'll start really quickly by asking, what is a framework? <laughs> before I reveal it to you. So we can think of it as a set of principles to guide thinking and practice. It's something that's, you know, intended to be used practically uh, and operationally, but it's also the product of research. So as you've seen, all the research that we've done has been, if you like, distilled into this framework. Um, it's not intended to be a standalone thing. So I'm going to show you the framework image uh, today, but this comes um, in the final report to NHRA um, and hopefully will be you know, disseminated further um, to emergency managers who can use it operationally with a set of um, detailed uh, sort of guidelines for use and um, a, a scenario. At least we, we certainly have a scenario for its use in the report. So um, it's not a thing where you look at the framework and you understand how to do compound hazard communication. It's much more detailed than that. Um, so as I said, it's set within a collection of guidelines for use, but I won't be presenting all of those today, given time um, time frame. Uh, it's also something that should be malleable, that should be flexible enough to allow improvements, updates, and certainly local nuance. And we just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that although this is a conceptual thing, it can also, could also, and should perhaps also be made tangible. So we've discussed as a research team, the fact that this framework could actually be made into an object, which could be used um, operationally, um, something that you know moves and stands in, in a room on a desk. Um, it could also equally be um, made into an interactive object digitally as well. It, it certainly, and that could be a useful way to think about its use in training for compound hazard communicators. So here we are, this is our image of our framework. As you can see, it's made up of various components, rings, it's supposed to be read from the in, and used from the inside towards the edges. So I'm going to go through each of the components. I know that time's quite short, so this will be just a very brief inter introduction to the framework, but please do delve in and uh, read our report to NHRA, um, which will be available within a couple of weeks um, and for, for greater information. So we start in the center of the framework with the compound hazard communicator. This may be an emergency manager, or it could be one of a wide spectrum of hazard communicators. They're the people that aim to uh, better engage communities before, during and after natural hazards. And um, we acknowledge and point out that, you know, the, in this work of preparedness, response, recovery um, and resilience building, uh, compound hazard communication should very much be a two way endeavour. Uh, it, should, it should incorporate listening to communities. That's something we heard very strongly through our research. Um, and we know that the research indicates that 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 is the best, you know, that's best practice. Um, so encourage participation uh, with uh, from communities and listening in the communication process. Um, we've included resilience here because that's something that we heard again and again from the communities that we work with. You probably note the similarity to the PPRR um, way of thinking about um, responding to, to hazards. So we've sort of, we build on that and adapt that with this preparedness, safety, recovery, and we add resilience as well. So those four things that I've just mentioned are then the goals of communication. They're at the heart of any communication uh, effort or endeavor. And, um, you know, so the goals of the compound hazard communicator should be building preparedness, uh, pre you know, making community safe during an event, recovery after an event, and then building resilience um, in the face of continuing hazards. Right, the next ring outwards. These are the barriers and opportunities. Erin um, alluded to some of these in, in her uh, part of the webinar. Um, and they are some of the conditions that we see as existing um, in uh, compound hazard affected communities. So those barriers that Erin mentioned, things like fatigue and confusion and distraction and displacement and not knowing perhaps uh, new hazards in an area that you've been displaced to, those all add up to vulnerability. And then they're of course 
pre-existing vulnerabilities um, that Erin also described. However, there are opportunities as well in that uh, communities that have experienced compound hazards have that experience and they may be able to share that with other community members for building resilience and building preparedness. Uh, that means that they may be more resourceful and if they've recently experienced a, a hazard event, they may already be mobilised. There may be um, kind of emergent groups that are, um, you know, existing in the community that are able to um, re-emerge when a new hazard prepares, uh, sorry, uh, eventuates um, and help community members prepare. So it's not all negative in terms of um, uh, communities' experiences of compound hazards in that they they, you know, experienced communities can also be more prepared, more resilient communities. So importantly, the compound hazard communicator based at the center of this framework needs to consider how to adjust their communication approaches to overcome those barriers and to capitalize on or build on uh, and work with those opportunities that compound hazard communication presents. Next slide, we come to the compound hazard communication principles, again, which Erin has described through um, her through the work that we've done to um, distill what we heard from communities. And, and we have created these into these uh, principles, which are local, inclusive, creative, clear, timely, credible, and reliable. And we think that, um, you know, uh, the compound has a communicator should endeavor to have their messages and engagement efforts incorporate as many of these principles principles as possible in each of their messages to communities and each of their engagement endeavors. While we recognize that not all messages and communication efforts can incorporate every principle every time. Um, I won't go into a thorough explanation of each um, of these principles, um, given the lack of time, but they are explained in great detail over pages in each of our, uh, sorry, in our um, report NHRA, and they include uh, uh, concrete um, empirical examples from our research that was done on the ground with community. So we hope that you'll delve in and read more about each of these principles. And finally, um, we call this outer ring the, the where we situate the enablers. So we know that the landscape for compound hazard engagement is a complex one with multiple sources, multiple messages, um, multiple channels, as Josh showed in, in the survey work just now. Um, and, and so it can be quite complex and chaotic. However, there, there are some actors in this landscape who can be really useful for the compound hazard communicator. And this is, again, distilled from our research. We call these enablers and they form that outer ring. They are the people, groups and organizations who can help achieve the spread of compound hazard messages, um, including community groups, um, uh, education uh, establishments, schools, universities, TAFE, um, of course, emergency services and recovery agencies who can work with the compound hazard communicator to proliferate consistent messaging, um, emergent groups, as I referred to a moment ago, when, when a hazard has already occurred, these may be uh, existing in a community. Uh, government, of course, at all levels is a powerful communicator and, and really important enabler for hazard communication, particularly so local government, as we experienced. Um, and media practitioners could, should be considered allies in this effort as well. It's often the case that um, compound hazard or, or hazard communicators have well-established relationships with media practitioners um, in, in the area that they serve. And finally, we uh, discovered in this research that business, local business can also be an enabler for hazard communication, spreading information to, to customers and employees. So that in a very brief nutshell is uh, our framework for compound hazard communication with the communicator at the center. Um, not much time to give you more detail, but um, we hope that this will pique your interest and you will then um, have a look at our full report to NHRA. Also, really importantly, we think that, um, you know, the next step on this will be training for compound hazard communicators on how you might use this framework and scenario planning using this framework. Um, so although our work on this aspect of the project is finished, we think that there are some further steps that are needed in order to operationalize um, and make make this framework useful on a day-to-day -day basis on the ground for engagement efforts.
So that's all from me. I'm going to hand over now to, to Shelley Smythe. If, if you'd like to follow the QR code there, um, you'll go to the NHRA uh, webpage on this uh, particular research project. So you can find out more there. So Shelley, over to you. Great, thank you, Gabby. Um, as you're aware, I'm the manager of community risk in Northwestern New South Wales with the Rural Fire Service, uh, and I work heavily in the preparedness space. However, during uh, escalating incidents and disasters, I can be deployed anywhere to head up a public information unit in an incident management team. And that can be for fires or floods or any other disaster. As a public information officer, well, my role is crucial in ensuring timely, clear and actionable information reaches the public during emergencies. And whilst I can try and understand a community, my biggest concern every time is that my, my communication is actually getting out there and it's being received by, by our members of the community. Um, and I need to know who needs what and do I do a targeted communication strategy or do I have a scattergun approach which uses significant resources? My initial review of this research is giving me better information and that enables me to build some tools to tailor my communications and ask some better questions, I think, to adapt my communication strategy. Uh, the facts are that we all need to really work better in this space. With the establishment of a framework based on this research, it gives me the opportunity to embed this into future iterations of training uh, to increase the effectiveness of how we reach our communities in both preparedness and during disasters. With the increasing frequency of extreme hazards um, and you know, everything that we're experiencing recently, communication strategies need to evolve to handle these compound natural hazards. Uh, we need to understand that community, communities become deafened to our noise, and that's certainly something that I experienced when I was at Tenerfield um, last year for their fires. And we need to look at uh, those creative ways that we can get our messages out there as highlighted in the interviews. From reading the research themes and having uh, been that public information officer at Tenerfield, I think the research has opened up that different set of questions for me um, in coming into a new community. I need to get a more holistic understanding of how my messages uh, can reach people during an emergency. Uh, using best practice and the principles will also give me some comfort that my strategies that I'm employing are based on research and uh, they're felt therefore more targeted to our communities. Finally, our aim is always to improve preparedness and reduce risk through better, more inclusive communication. Uh, so it's been a real privilege to be involved in this, uh, this research uh, in a topic that's been uh, really close to my heart. So thank you. Thanks, Gabby. Well, thank you everyone to all of our panelists today. Um, we've got some questions. We've got a couple that have come through um, the Q&A, but I've got one that I wanted to um, ask first. Just bear with me for a minute. Um, to Gabby and Erin. So the development of this framework used a different approach in its design. So there's other communications frameworks that are in existence at the moment. Um, but this one, you use perspectives and research with communities uh, with lived experience in compound natural hazard events in its development. And I'd be really interested to hear what are the key differences in your opinion between this framework and the other existing community engagement frameworks that are in use currently? Gabby? Sure, happy to speak to that. So. In fact, there, as you said, as you alluded to, uh, Nicola, there's a range of frameworks. There's the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework for, from 2018, which uh, has a priority one action that says to improve public awareness of and engagement uh, on disaster risks and impacts. So it recognises that communication is central. Um, that particular framework doesn't uh, include compound hazards. It doesn't consider compound hazards. And as we've shown, communicating for compound hazards is slightly different. Um, we also, of course, draw on things like the community engagement framework of the National Strategy for Disaster Resilience, uh, 
Um, and also on Cook, uh, Brian Cook's CEDAR, CEDAR, I think you call it, framework for community engagement for disaster risk reduction. Now, both of those are really valuable when it comes to working with community and thinking of participatory communication um, and, and listening. However, neither um, incorporate um, thinking about compound hazards specifically. So we wanted to do two things. We wanted to produce a framework that looked at what was specific about compound hazards and could, um, could help to prepare communities for this new, perhaps, you know, I want to say new type of hazard. It's not new, but it's this increasing risk of these particular hazards, but also really listen to uh, and thought about what communities feel and think and want and what their needs are in terms of communication. And that is intensely specific and local as well, which is why at the top of our hazard communication framework, that local or localized principle is, you know, if any principle is, is the key, that one is possibly the first one to think about because um, any, any engagement with communities needs to fully understand the local circumstances, both from the hazard point of view, the demographic, the vulnerabilities, <clears throat> the communication landscape, trust or not in, in local institutions and media and sources and so on. So, <clears throat> so we really wanted to prioritize um, that work with communities on compound hazards specifically and incorporate co-creation, which we which we in, we've endeavored to do. And we think that the product that we've come out with is is a product of co-creation. Thanks. Thanks, Gabby. One more for, for Erin. Um, Erin, the team facilitated two workshops on the draft framework uh, with agency representatives and community members from the case study locations. Can you share with us the sort of feedback that was provided and how this was used to further develop the framework and associated um, guidance materials? Thanks, Nicola. Yeah, the, the feedback sessions were in a really important step in our process of developing the framework. Um, they helped us do a number of things. They helped us refine aspects of the framework, consolidate. Um, they confirmed some of the things we were thinking and they gave us different perspectives on, on some of the things we were thinking. Uh, one of the really strong uh, pieces of feedback that came from the first feedback forum was around resilience and the importance of resilience. It, it became uh, a really central talking point at that, at that particular forum. Mm. Um, and following that, we actually centralised resilience. So when Gabby was showing the framework, you could see that resilience is represented right in the centre. Initially, we had three kind of goals or aims of, of community engagement, which were um, preparation, safety and recovery. Um, and we added resilience in after that um, first feedback because we were hearing from stakeholders that communities... Uh, creating resilient communities is a goal of communication. It is a goal of community engagement and it is important in the face of compound hazards. So, um, so that, that is why that is there. Some of the language around how we are articulating uh, the framework principles and the ideas behind them also was consolidated through the feedback. So the idea of learned helplessness came from the first feedback forum. Um, in particular, to, re to replace the idea or to make sure we weren't talking about communities in terms of complacency, which has some negative connotations. So we, we, can't, we can't attribute blame to communities. We do need to actually um, consider, consider the, the impacts of these, of these um, events on communities, but also um, not necessarily not necessarily assume that communities are becoming complacent. So the idea of learned helplessness was a really important way of, of thinking about how communities are experiencing these events. Thanks, Erin. I'm, I'm really um, looking forward to seeing the framework and the guidance um, in your in your final report. Um, I'm really interested in um, your comment um, on lived experience can build social capital. And does the framework provide guidance on how to leverage this social capital that's getting built as communities experience these events? It's yeah. certainly one of our goals, and it was a really important finding, I think, that that um, these communities who had been through some terrible, terrible string of events were also in a, in a strong position um, and that the, the groups and the individual leaders who had emerged during these disasters um, 
were poised to act again and to help the community come together again. So I think certainly leveraging the existing strengths of these communities is really important moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. A couple for you, Shelley. We've got a few that have come through. Sorry. <laughs> Throw some your way. Um, Sue Atkinson's asked, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, Shelley. How do you think this framework could be used by communities themselves to increase their own capacity to be resilient? A really good question. I think um, I think what any of our community-led activities or initiatives, you could potentially use the framework as as a and the the principles as a, a guiding. Uh, sense of how how do we, how does a community integrate its own communications um, because that's also really important because we do have examples where um, I, I worked during the floods um, for SES and at four a.m. I'm I'm um, speaking to a radio station about uh, evacuating George's River in Sydney so. And they're those times where you do need those um, those community interactions and those really strong um, pre-planned, uh, prepared communities to be able to enact what they need to do. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah. That's great. Thank, thank you, Shelley. And thank you, Josh, Erin and Gabby as well. Uh, folk, we have, we have met time. We're just going to go a little bit over for those of you who can stay with us. Um, the questions that we haven't got to, don't worry, we'll include them in a follow-up email, uh, responses to those questions. Thanks to everybody who's joined us today online. As I noted, links to the webinar recording, the presentation materials and um, upcoming hazardous, hazardous webinars will be sent out to all of you via email in the next week or two. We're going to include a link to a short survey in this email. To catch any feedback you'd like to share on today's webinar and this research project, because we're keen to hear from you, your ideas on ways you might apply the framework once it's published and other ways we could communicate the findings. So I'd encourage you to take five minutes and let us know your thoughts when you get our email. Um, we intend to publish the framework and associated project report. Probably um, it might come to us in a couple of weeks, but it might take us a little bit to get it up online. So we've got all your email addresses and we'll be able to direct message you once that is available on our website. We also have plenty of online and in-person events coming up, including next month's hazardous webinar on critical infrastructure and resilient lifelines in regional and remote communities with Professor Lauren Rickards, Dr. Adrienne Keating and John Richardson. So for updates of everything Natural Hazards Research Australia, please sign up to our newsletter and follow us on social media. You can access these via the homepage on our website. And thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everyone.